I trade each morning at eight o'clock. I trade the futures market, which is the global market, and I trade the bond market. So I'm able to make pretty much my 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 living in 20 minutes in the morning. So from 8:20 to about 8:40, I'm pretty much making my money for the month, and then I'm done. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you smash that like button and click subscribe. For those of you listening on a podcast platform, be sure to subscribe on whatever platform that is and leave us a rating if you can. The more likes, ratings, and subscriptions that we get, the more we can spread the message and grow our community. So we also have a free Facebook group. It's called The Average Joe Finances Network. Check us out, join the group, join the community, ask questions, and become a part of the team. All of our other social media accounts are listed in our flow page, and we have them in the video or podcast description below. Hey, how's it going, everybody? So today's guest is David Torrance, aka King David, and he is the CEO of Throne CG, an investing consulting firm and the founder of KP Cares Foundation Incorporated, a nonprofit geared towards assisting under-resourced communities in bridging the wealth gap. As a first-generation college graduate from University of Central Florida, where he received his bachelor's degree and his master's degree at Liberty University, David's passion is to serve and be of service to his community. As an investor and philanthropist, his mission is to give back by showing minorities how to gain financial freedom through the stock market. And I want to add that something I have from just a conversation with him before I hit the record button is that David, and we'll talk about this too, King David here is currently retired at a young age. So really excited to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for talking with me. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it for being here. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely. Hey, the first thing I'd like to ask, it's, it's what I ask every guest that comes on the show. And I shared a little bit of your background and just, just wave tops. So I'd like to get a little bit deeper into the ocean here. Can you explain to us a little bit or just share a little bit more about yourself and your story? How did this all get started for you? Yeah, my career prior to this was in sports. I was the director of strength and performance at a private Christian. And so I trained athletes for the good part of my career. I've trained players such as Michael Beasley, played for the Miami Heat, um, Tyreek Evans. I played, I've trained a lot of collegiate athletes that come out of Florida, such as Sam Griffin, Ben Middlebrook. These are guys who've gone D1 to play basketball. So that was my initial background, but I always knew that career was not going to be enough for me to have the lifestyle in which I wanted. Why do you ask? Because when you're training and you're a trainer, you're trading your time for dollars. And there's all your cap on how many hours you can work in a day, therefore your money is capped. So I knew I had to find a way in order to live the lifestyle in which I wanted to live and have a, some sense of freedom and not feel like I was always gonna have to train someone and live that lifestyle. Though I love what I did, it wasn't gonna be sustainable for the type of person I knew I wanted to be. So with that in mind, I took up investing and uh, simply put my cousin, who's a who's an analyst, who's a financial analyst, mentored for a while and got me started. And then once I made my first little piece of money, I got hooked because I realized I made a thousand dollars and I didn't do it. It took me two minutes to do it and I didn't have to watch it happen. I came back to my phone and I had money sitting there waiting. And from there, I, I went on the journey just to find out how could I scale this? How could I learn more? And how could I make enough to match what I was making at my current job? And when I was able to make in a week what I made in a month, I knew I have something here. And then from there it was about being able to do it over a year time frame. Once I did over a year time frame, I said, I'm gone. And two years later, here we are. Wow, that's amazing. So it, it sounds like you were able to do this in such a short time period. And you found you found a way to stop trading your your time for dollars, like you said earlier. So I'm sitting mm -hmm. here taking down notes as you're talking and just in your intro alone, I've already got some really great golden nuggets here, which is absolutely amazing <laughs> because you're absolutely right. Your time in the day is capped and we've only got 24 hours and somewhere in there, you need to eat and sleep and just yeah. take care of yourself and have some personal time. So mm -hmm. 
how do you keep keep the money flowing in where you're not trading all that time for money? And you started off in, in a pretty great career field. And it sounds like you did really well, especially with some of the athletes that you train, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. But you realize as much as you loved what you did, you had to change the game a bit to be able to, you know, move on in life and get to the point where you're at right now where you're retired. Yeah. So I wanted to ask, because we didn't talk about this before we recorded, but how old are you right now? I'm 27. 27 years old, people. You hear that? 27 years old. That's amazing, man. What are you currently doing right now? So now that you've reached this spot of financial independence, what are you doing right now in this journey? What is it that sustains you? From a financial standpoint? Yeah. So from a financial standpoint, my ability to trade and also invest, there are two different things. A lot of people think investing and trading are the same thing. They're not. So I have long-term investments through a self-directed Roth, as well as a individual brokerage. And then that cool, one cool snippet I'll, I'll just throw in here really quick. I know we're going to get into it is I leveraged my job to get to where I'm at. And I'll go more into detail about that on, on a twofold standpoint. But also on my trade, I trade each morning. At eight o'clock, I trade the futures market, which is the global market, and I trade the bond market. So I'm able to make pretty much my 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 living in 20 minutes in the morning. So from 8:20 to about 8:40, I'm pretty much making my money for the month, and then I'm done. And then from there, everything else I do is committed towards my consulting firm or my nonprofit, and that's pretty much what sustains me in terms of financial standpoint, also my time. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's a very minuscule amount of time in the day for you to make the the income that you live off of in just mm -hmm. such a short period and that's fantastic yeah. so it's the power of investing there's so many ways to invest as we know it's just the one that i found best that suits me and that i have an expertise in but it, it, there's so many other ways to do it yeah right on so uh, i have to ask it was your cousin right your cousin that was a he's a uh, financial uh, analyst okay so he's a financial mm -hmm. analyst and what made you go to him to say, hey, cuz, I, I want to learn how to do A, B, C, and D. Like, how do I yeah. do this? What, what motivated you to do that? So initially, he tried to teach me when I was in college. Because when I was in college and I was working in the hospital doing, I worked in physical therapy for three years and I was doing sports and medicine rehab. There's an older gentleman that told me, hey, young man, this is going to sound weird, but you should really get into investing. You'll love yourself for it later. I was like, all right. And then I had a conversation with my dad. My dad was like, your cousin, he just finished his, um, he's got his second master's in finance. You know, that's what he's doing. So I contacted him and he tried to tell me about it then. And it, of course, I got interested. I, I bought a book. I didn't finish it. I bought a stock. It was a penny stock. I didn't make any money off of it. I lost a hundred bucks. And then I, I don't know what happened. I was just moved to find a way to make money without having to work. And I was like, let me try investing again. So I found my way back to my cousin. He was like, blew me off a little bit because I didn't take it seriously the first time. And he tested me. He said, he gave me a few things to do. He gave me two books to read and a video to watch. And he said, come see me after you did that. And it took me a while, it took me about two months, and then I did it. And then from there, the rest is history. He taught me everything I need to know to get started. And from there, he didn't have to teach me anymore because I was kind of hooked. Awesome. Hey, can, I, can I ask you what those two books were? Yeah, one was The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. The other one was, it was a book by Warren Buffett. I don't know what book it was. And the video was um, the, the Economic Machine by Ray Dalio, who runs Bridgewater's Hedge Fund. The Economic Machine? Yeah, the video Economic Machine. Yeah, mm -hmm. that video and then Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham, who was Warren Buffett's uh, mentor. Okay. So right he's on. like the king of value investing. So d did you have to like really nag your cousin and just pursue him a bunch? Because <laughs> you said he wasn't taking you seriously at first because yeah. you, were, you blew him off the first time. So how often did you have to like hit him up? Hey, man, like I'm serious this time. Let's do this. Yeah. When, when I started like sending him a note, pictures of me taking notes, he, that's when he started taking me a little bit serious. It wasn't that much like, I because he lives in California, so there's a time difference too. I, I hit him up, I text him and he will just say, all right, good job. Keep it up. But did you do this? I'm like, no, I didn't finish the book yet. Well, finish the book. And it was, it was that bad back and forth for a while. But initially I was actually, I actually had a little bit of money. I was like, yo, just tell me what plays to get and what I'm trying to learn. Tell me where to put my money. And he was like, no, he was like, figure it out, learn. And, and then we'll, we'll have that conversation. And he did help me out for my first investment. I never forget. It was an options trade for a square. It was okay. square. I, I, I did a short term option call during their Q, Q1 earnings. And their stock price like jumped 10 bucks on the option side. That money's exponential. So it was almost like a thousand dollar return I had gotten. 
that's when I got hooked. Awesome. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, I think one of the key things to take away from this entire thing is just you were, you were persistent and you educated yourself. And that's the biggest thing is making sure that you educate yourself before you go and start dumping money in. You gave a good example, right? The first time you invested, you bought into a penny stock, lost a hundred bucks. Yeah. And you're probably like, oh, I don't know if this is for me, man. I've lost some money on penny stocks too. It, it happens, but that's just, that was stuff I was playing around with. It's Anytime you invest in a penny stock, it's normally, you should only put money that you're okay with losing. It's like a gamble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Um, it is. So that, yeah, for sure, man. So that's awesome. So you were persistent, you got yourself educated, Mm -hmm. and now you are where you are today, right? So now what is it that, that changed the trajectory for you, right? So you got educated, you read the book, and you started investing in options, right? What was the next step after that to get yourself to the point where in three years, that this is now what you do full time. So like, or well, not full time yeah. for 20 minutes a day. So like, what is it that got you to that point? What was the threshold that you had to get past? Well, I'll be honest with you. I wasn't profitable for a long time. When it came to trading, investing is, is it's easy to be profitable because you're holding long term. So in the, on the investing side, I was cool because I had long term investments. I've been holding Apple for the past three years. So that was my biggest, that was my biggest investment initially. I was really, that was the only stock I owned for a while. So I wasn't very profitable in my trading. And that's when I made the biggest leap when I got f- profitable by trading. And my cousin introduced me to future. And then once I got introduced to the futures market and I lost a bunch of money attempting to do that and then took a step back and got some mastery. That's when I made this huge jump and my money grew exponentially enough to where I could maintain, continuing to scale that amount of money. Cause it's different to make money one or two times and you hit, you make a grand, you hit big. That's very common when investing. It's easy to do actually. The hardest part is to do that and continuing to do it without losing to where you almost started from square one again. That is the hardest part over a year, two year time frame. That is the hardest. So when I got the patience and the structure and the discipline to do that, that I made my biggest jump. So it had nothing to do with really skill. It actually had to do with me learning myself, how greedy I was, my anxiety when it came to trading. Because we're talking about trading, not investing. There's a lot of psychology that's attached to trading that a lot of people gloss over, but it really is what makes or breaks the best traders, the psychology and the discipline, not really the skill. Because if it was skill, it's all up, down. Can you Mm -hmm. guess which one is that? That's easy. The the hard part is the human nature aspect of it. Yeah, and and actually, as you were talking, that's the the one word I wrote down out of that whole thing was discipline. So, you know, and and the huge difference, like you're saying, between trading and investing. When you're investing, that's your long-term stuff. That's the, the stuff you're saving for the future. Retirement. Yeah. We're retirement age. I'm sorry. Retirement age right. by the, by America, quote unquote. Yeah. But what you're doing right now with your trading is you got to, you have to make enough to where not only do you have enough to trade the next day, but you have enough to spend for what you need to spend on for that day as well. So right. you're, this is also your income, right? So you have to make sure you have enough put to the side to pay the taxes on your gains. You have Mm -hmm. to make sure you have enough put to the side to be able to live your daily life. And on top of all that, still have enough to invest the next day and continue to build and build on top of that. So obviously that's what you've done. And you've got yourself to a point now you were able to build up enough capital to have money to continue trading and still take out when you need to. So Mm -hmm. that's as well as investing, as well as investing too, because I, I treat the, the thing that I feel like also gives me a competitive edge is I treat my trading like a true business. I'm literally, I treat it, but there's a certain amount of money that goes towards longer term investments that comes from that trading. So guess what? Something goes left. David has a bad week. David has a bad month. Guess what? I've been taking profits aside, not only to pay the bills and be a, a productive citizen, but also to make sure that if anything happens, well, you know what? I have money to pull from to where I can get my account back to a place I know it needs to be in order for me to continue investing. And also to keep right. the business afloat because there's cool little things that I, different research um, engines I use that I have to pay for. Those things matter and that's an expense in the business, right? So mm-hmm. those kind of things are important. So now also on top of that, you also have a consulting firm, right? So you're right. consulting other people and uh, in businesses, I, I would guess, or? Yeah, I, I consult other people in their investments and I also consult businesses and nonprofits for investing. So teaching them okay. 
how to better use free cash flow within their business. Typically, if it's a profitable business, you have free cash flow, money that you have sent to the side after expenses after tax. So we're talking earn, so we're talking earned income. Mm-hmm. And I'm usually um, consulting people or businesses or nonprofits on how can you best allocate that capital because inflation and taxes are going to kill you. Like you said, like off air, when you spoke about if you make X amount per month and it stays there, the cost of living going up, inflation, the cost of gas, milk and everything going up, that X amount of dollars won't buy you the same now than the world later. Yeah, so that's absolutely. why it's important to invest free cash flow or any money you have seen on the side and not to truly hold on to a savings account like we may have traditionally been taught. Right. No, I'm a firm believer in having emergency cash, like having an emergency mm-hmm. fund. But other than that, you shouldn't have just cash sitting in the bank because being very conservative right now on this year's like the way it's looking, but they're saying we're going to have a 4% inflation, 4%. And if mm-hmm. your money is sitting in a checking account, that's getting 0.025%, <laughs> you're literally losing 3.75% yes. every on your dollar. month on your dollar. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that is definitely, you're losing money. By holding cash, you're losing money. And that's, that's why some people say that cash is trash. Some people say cash is king and, and it is to a certain extent, right? Mm-hmm. I, agree. I like what you just said there too, because cash can be and cash is trash if you're just sitting there holding it and you're not mm-hmm. using that cash towards something. So you can make cash king by actually investing it and getting a mm-hmm. return that's mm-hmm. going to beat inflation. Because if you're yes. not beating inflation, you're losing money. All Correct, Mike. I, I agree 100%. If you don't mind me asking, yeah. how long, I love that, but how long did it take you to come to that realization? Because I think that is important too, because- Too long. I think it's some- uh, <laughs> Much, much older than when you realized it. I can tell you that. Yeah, uh, that's the problem I have with society. I feel like we're not educating our youth enough to understand that and know that. Absolutely. Yeah, and my, I realized, so- I started, let me see, I am 37 now. Yeah. It was shortly before I moved to, a couple of years before I moved to Hawaii when uh, Mm -hmm. we decided that we needed to figure out how to get out of debt because I had a lot of credit card debt. I had loans. I had all this stuff because, you know, I was living my life the way society teaches you to live life and saying, if you've got the money, spend it because you only live once. And so what if you rack up a whole bunch of credit? You just keep paying it off until the day you die. No, that's not how you should live life, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. I'm not scared of debt. I'm not scared to have debt. I I believe debt is a tool if you manage it correctly and you leverage it. And that's something I had to learn. However, there's there's certain debt like consumer debt, credit cards, personal yes. loans and things like that, that does Correct. absolutely nothing for you. It took a while to realize that. And when, and once I did, my wife and I, we decided, okay, it's time to get serious about this, pay off our debt. Uh, we knew we wanted to move to Hawaii. I was negotiating for orders to come to Hawaii. So we said, hey, we need to get rid of this $27,000 in debt and have money saved for a down payment or for renovations or repairs to a home because we want to buy a home in Hawaii. So I said, okay, cool. So we come up with a game plan. We built our budget. We started off following Dave Ramsey's baby steps. We got to step three where we paid <laughs> off all of our debt and then we went elsewhere because mm-hmm. I didn't want to continue going down that road because, hey, I paid off my bad debt, my consumer debt. Now it's time to take on debt that I can leverage, aka my mortgage, to continue on. So we did. We paid off the debt. We wound up saving $40,000. In a two-year period, we paid off the $27,000 debt. We had $40,000 in the bank. But when we moved to Hawaii, to come out here as a down payment or yada. Didn't need a down payment, right? Because being in the military, I was able to use my VA loan. So I did 0% yeah. down. We used some of that money towards closing costs because we didn't want to roll it in. And then the rest of it, like when we bought the house, we knew there were certain things we wanted to change. So we took that money and invested it into the home and, and made our renovations. So fast forward to where we are now, I bought the house for- uh, I was just about to ask full, that. I was going to ask how much is it worth now? I'll go, full di- I'll go full disclosure here. I bought it three years ago for about 785000 And okay. today I could sell it for 1.1 or more three years later. And that's, that's awesome. That's without getting it looked at. I'm sure if I had an appraiser come in here and they saw all the renovations and stuff that we did, the, the upgrades we had, I'm pretty happy with where we're at right now. That's a so, great investment. That's a long-term absolutely. investment, a strategic, very intentful long-term investment that is going to pay us. So, some people wouldn't look at your primary residence as an investment, but I do. And here's why, because I do plan on very shortly here, taking out a home equity line of credit to pull some of my equity out 
and invest that. Got so it. I'm looking at getting into my first uh, syndication here, buying into apartments because awesome. I feel Cash like that well. is one of the like one of the safer pieces of real estate to buy when the market is looking crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people think that the real estate market, the bubble is going to pop soon. And, and to like me, I look at it, it, it depends. There's a lot of the same things happening that happened back in 2008 and 2009. Key things that's not happening is, happening is you don't see like that predatory lending. Yeah, the mortgage um, back loan is a better spot. Yeah. So anyway, I, I don't want to go off too much on a tangent, but yeah. So I, <laughs> I am, I'm with you there, hundred percent. Um, I'm not going to say cash is king. I'm, I'm, I, I think I like the whole new mantra of cash is trash. Let's take a brief moment to hear from our show sponsors. What's going on, everybody? So today I want to talk to you about Buzzsprout. The Average Joe Finances podcast recently switched over to Buzzsprout, and I got to say, I am super happy with the progress. Our podcast is now on every single major platform and reaching audiences that we couldn't reach before, which is just super awesome. So thank you to Buzzsprout for being such a great platform. But also I want to say, hey, guys, if you sign up for Buzzsprout and you sign up for one of their paid plans using our link, you'll get a $20 Amazon gift card. So go check them out. It's averagejoefinances.com slash Buzzsprout. And we'll make sure the link is in the show notes below. What's going on, everybody? So today I want to talk to you about the podcast editing service that we use for the Average Joe Finances podcast. That is editpods.com. And what I really like about them is it's a subscription-based service, so the prices are fantastic. And not only do they do the podcast episodes for us, but they also make us videos, audiograms, social media caption videos. They do our show notes, thumbnails. It's just fantastic products. Go check them out at editpods.com. Let's get back to today's episode. It, it, no, um, it depends. It depends on with you 100%. It depends on what you do. It's always what context, it for. right? There's yep. always context attached to it. It depends on what you do. And I love how you see, you kept pointing out because there's a right. difference. And we talked about hyperconsumption. And I, and unfortunately, we have too many people who are caught up in hyperconsumption. And I often, and, and this is the funny part, and, and I, I'll let you go into your next question. People always ask me, David, what should I invest in? They always ask me that. And I always say, what do you spend your money on? Mm. That's the easiest way to get investing. Think yeah. about what you spend your money. And, I, and this is my always go-to. I have an Apple phone. I have a tablet. I have an Apple watch. If there's a, a trillion dollar market cap company right there. That's the highest weighting in the S&P 500. They yeah, didn't they just hit 2 trillion? 2, two trillion. They're on their way to Microsoft. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. No, no, no. Apple's almost at three trillion. Apple hit oh, three wow. trillion already. Apple's already hit three trillion. Microsoft just hit two trillion. Yep. I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Facebook too. Facebook just hit two trillion. Really? I don't yes, know. Tracking that. It did. They just hit two trillion. So I always tell people there's a company right there. Where do you buy most of your stuff from? Amazon. There, find the ETF that has Amazon in its holding so you can have direct exposure to it. Like when we're talking about investing, it's so easy to get started. Just think about what you spend. And you know, I always say ladies make the best investors because they're more in touch with the consumer side because they typically do. Yeah, that's fair. And I, I like that you didn't just say to invest directly into Amazon. You said find an ETF that, that invests in Amazon because there's a lot of people out there that don't want to invest directly into a individual index. or a single stock mm -hmm. and ETFs and index funds and things like that. Mutual funds, those are different ways to invest in many different stocks at right. once and get a piece of that pie without having to cut the whole thing out mm -hmm. and or going for that individual singular piece. You, you get a piece Correct. of the whole pie. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a cheater's code to the market. Indexes yeah. and ETFs are cheater's code into the market, literally. Yeah. No, I like it. I like it. Speaking of cheaters codes, right? So I had asked you for some topics for us to discuss. And one of the things you sent me, so I want to talk about this, mm -hmm. is what are your thoughts, speaking of cheaters codes, right? We're going to talk about games here. What are your thoughts on GameStop? All right. Oh, here we go. I can, I can tell you the juices are flowing. Let's go. <laughs> so when it came, when it comes to GameStop, in my opinion, I believe GameStop is not a bunch of people in Reddit coming together to push back against the powers that be. I oh, believe okay. there's, okay, tell I actually, me. let's get into that. I actually believe that there's an institutional money behind it. I believe that okay. there's instant, okay. I believe that there's big institutions playing both sides. I believe there's big institutions that only that are buying up the stock, but they're probably buying it out of their personal account or whatever. And then they're also having 
short term puts on the other side. So if they get squeezed out, they want to hold in the, on the stock. But if they lose, right? They, if they, but if they're on the opposite side and they're actually not getting squeezed out, they're winning on the put side, on the option side. I believe institutional money is driving it. I do not believe that there's enough retail trade to push GameStop in the way in which it's been shared and been pushed. Second thing, I do not believe it's a good investment. I believe it's a great trade. If I'm being honest about it, it's a great trade. It's yeah. not a great that's investment. Not, it's, it's not something that you would buy and hold until your retirement age. Correct. Exactly. And that's what I mean. Thank you for giving that context. That's what I mean, because it's important. I'm always trying to make sure I give the context between trading and investing because people use them interchangeably. They're not. But it's, but if you know how to trade, it's a great trade. I didn't. It's not a part of my trading thesis. So I'm really big on I have a, a thesis for the year and I'm sticking to those parameters. And that lets me know where I should be looking when I'm wanting to allocate capital I and mean, also where I should be pulling out and where my my sentiment lies within certain industries certain indexes and certain sectors. I, I love GameStop and it's, it's the money to be made, but I don't believe that it's the people pushing back against institutional investors. I believe there's actual yeah. institutional money influencing it more than we think it does. And, I, and because both sides have something to win. And if you don't believe me, Robinhood just went through a really uh, bad lawsuit and I, they're going to have another one coming towards them as well. In due time, I feel like there's going to be news coming out about that. We'll see that is more institutionally driven than people think. Because if you think about the landscape of the stock market prior to the GameStop, we had a huge run up coming out of coronavirus, right? You had ARC Fund that was doing very well. Everyone made money. It's pretty much easy to make money from March 20, from April 2020 to January 2021. Yep. Money was easy to be made. You couldn't lose. You had Tesla stock split. You had Apple talk, uh, stock split. There was nowhere to lose money. Every earnings, everything was going jumping up. But what happened was there needed to be a rebalancing. And you saw that in the beginning of this year, we rotated out of tech and we went into what? Cyclical, non-cyclical stocks, defensive stocks, right? And indexes have been ruling the market right now. The S&P is at an all-time high. It's been on the tear for almost the biggest since 19, some before I was born. The NASDAQ <laughs> is not at an all-time, and that is at an all-time high, but has lagged behind the S&P and the Dow, which is unusual. By the way, the Dow is the industrial. So that when I'm talking about defensive stocks, the Dow has been really running up. Mm -hmm. So I know I'm saying a lot right now, but I'm, I'm going to get some. I'm, I'm, I'm saying all that to say because of all that and there need to be a rebalancing. I think institutions were really looking to these meme stocks as a way to get their to meet their benchmarks. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, that's that's definitely interesting because I, I don't think so. Neither myself nor many other people out there were thinking like that. I, I saw the whole Reddit thing and the meme stonks and all that yeah. other stuff and hodl mm -hmm. and all that good stuff that's still going on. When you think about it, it does make a lot of sense that for, for, the, for there to be such a rise and such a big difference that not there's not enough retail investors to get it to that point. I think, what is it? 90% of the market is institutional money mm -hmm. and 10% is Correct. you and me, the everyday average Joe investor mm -hmm. or trader that's mm -hmm. the uh, the other 10%. When you put it into that light, it makes a lot of sense. 10% can make a significant difference. But, right? but the whole, but that's the you relying that on the though. entire 10% to mm -hmm. make a difference. And it's the whole did it. I, I didn't invest in GameStop. You didn't invest in GameStop. No, I didn't trade it either. And, and that's the, yeah. and the thing, even, and this is why I tell people, even if you think there's enough people to buy it, you got to remember, in order for a stock to hold that long, you have to continue to buy it. That's the kicker. Who I don't know. I don't know about you, but I don't know. Well, the people that I know that are working normal jobs day to day, they don't have two hundred dollars to be buying a stock every day. That's almost yeah. a car bill. If I'm, no one has my, I don't even have money like to buy a stock uh, ever. That same stock every day for this amount of time that's been held up this long. No, there's no way that was just retail traders doing that or behind it. So. I call BS to the news that says it is. And if someone thinks I'm wrong, I would love to see the facts to prove it because I just don't see the numbers adding up. Yeah, I like it. And, and I think part of it too is, you know, you get fed information every day from the, the news, from all the different media outlets, news articles mm -hmm. online, TV, CNBC, and all that stuff. And as you're sitting here watching this stuff, you keep hearing that it's the Reddit crew. It's these guys that the diamond hands crew mm -hmm. and you keep thinking, Oh wow, these guys are really sticking it to the man. Yeah. But at the same time, it's, you know, what you're saying makes perfect sense. Like how are you maintaining at this point? Cause I can tell you right now, if I had GameStop at $20 a share and I had that many shares that when it jumped up to 300 something, 
those diamond hands are crystallizing and melting because I would have been yes. like exactly like Correct. I'm going to sit here on forty million dollars and be like I'm going to hold forty mil and stick it to the man. Mm-hmm. Nah, man, no, I'm selling. That doesn't I'm, make I'm any sense. Find my sailboat and I'm out of here. Correct. Human psychology tells us people would have yeah. took profit a long time ago. And, and remember, stock, and, and for the viewers, stock price usually changes by supply and demand. So if everyone's selling all their shares for making a profit, the stock price should typically dip. Yep, absolutely. And, and it did dip a little bit. And that's probably all the re, all the, uh, the the individual investors sitting Retail. out there mm-hmm. selling their own stocks and getting out when it was so mm-hmm. high. Now, I know some people that traded GameStop and AMC and, and, and all those, BlackBerry, all, all the meme stonks, and every single one of them, I'm pretty sure, are out now uh, of my friends that I know that bought into that stuff. I, I think part of this whole thing, and I want to kind of transition into something else that you wanted to talk about, mm-hmm. because we're, we talked about, uh, I want to rewind back to one of the fundamentals we started with, which was education and the thing that got you started and how you learned how to trade and how important that is with education. One of the things that you and I talked about was at what age, like you asked me, at what age did I realize that I needed to make this change? And I told you significantly later than when you realized it. One of the topics you wanted to discuss, and I love this topic, is teaching children about investing, right? And for me, it's about just teaching them financial and fiscal responsibility. And this is something that you don't see in public education. Now, mm-hmm. my, my children are homeschooled and part of our curriculum is financial literacy. So we make sure they understand how to make a budget, how to pay bills and things like that. I'm teaching them at a very young age so that when they do move on out of the house at the age of 18 or 30 or whenever they want to leave, because I'd like them to stay as long as they can, I love them. They're awesome. But at the same time, it's, I want to know that when they walk out the, the door for the last time for that, they're not going to be sleeping under this roof anymore, that I've set them up for success. And not that I'm just going to give them money and go say, Hey, go live your life. I, I invested mm-hmm. enough for us all. So here you go. No, I want them to go out and learn and earn themselves. So getting into the topic of teaching children about investing, what is it about that you're passionate about? Yeah, so I'm really passionate about that because um, in my household and many people that I speak to, dad is usually the breadwinner and dad makes the money and the family is just uh, comfortable. And and that's typically, or right, you struggle and mom does what she can to make money and you go about life as such. So one of the things that I'm really passionate about and I care about is teaching children about investing and my nonprofit, that's what we we're able to do. I created a stock market at Tim. It's called the Wall Street Twins. And it's basically it's an entry level way of kids to learn about the stock market. So they learn what time the market opens. They learn what a bull market, what a bear market is, what an asset is, a liability, not through words, through illustrations. So I'm really passionate about that because kids, unbeknownst to parents, you can teach your kids as soon as the age of six about how to invest. It's very simple. What does green mean? Green means down. They can, they know the color and signal of a candlestick right there. And what does a bull market mean? What does a bear market mean? Things of that sort. How many sectors are there in the market? There's 11. Those are cool little fun facts you can teach your child. Name a company in the stock market, Apple, right? They're on your tablet all the time. What's another company you can invest in? Tesla. Yeah, no, that's a car. And all you're doing right now is just teaching them the basic illustration and the lingo of investing. Because if you can teach your child the lingo, That's half the battle. I believe that investing for a long time was not meant for the general public. So there was a high barrier of entry because of the language. You hear inflation, you hear quantitative easing. These words push back, oh, that's too much. Or if you are into it, you don't want to learn enough about it to get good. You just know you want to put your money here. And if you make this in return, you you get out and you try to do it again when it dips. But you really don't get into the nicks and crevices of it. So I'm really passionate about teaching children about investing because I believe that's how we bridge the wealth gap. I believe that we can bridge the wealth gap by starting at a young age and just introducing them to the images, right? Many kids learn through images. They don't know, a kid doesn't know what an app, they don't know, when they say Apple, they don't see A-P-L-E. They see a big red thing with a little stem at the top. It's the illustrations in which we should be teaching kids. So we should use that traditional way of learning as our forefront of how we teach them about investing. Yeah, I I love that. That's absolutely amazing. And You're doing that right now with your nonprofit, and that's called KP Mm -hmm. Cares Foundation, right? Correct. 
Yeah, David, that's phenomenal, man. So you're doing things right now. I, I know in your bio, we talked about you're also a philanthropist and everything. The fact that you're giving back so much is it has, it carries so much more meaning than just this conversation that we're having. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? So it's, there's power in that. And part of that is you're going to get that back in abundance, what you're giving back. And it's amazing when you can give back to a community or you can help others, how much you get back in return for that. Not, and, and it's not just like a, a self pat on the back or the gratification you get out of it, but th that is mm -hmm. definitely nice that you're, you, it makes you feel good when you're able to help other people. When you can actually see the difference that you've made and children in the future, I'm going a little bit down a rabbit hole here, but like when you're a bit older in age and you start seeing some of these kids that, that read your book or learned about stock market at such a young age, thanks to listening to you or advice that you've given in the past. And you're sitting there in, in your rocking chair one day and you're like, yeah, seeing these kids just being successful entrepreneurs and that you had an impact on that. Man, what a way to to have a good life. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I agree 100%. And I, and I don't have children yet, but you know what? I, another reason I wanted something for my kids. I yeah. need, uh, that's how I got. So I was like, I want to make sure my kid is just as good as I am. How can I get them to be 27? How can I get them to learn? And, I, and that was kind of the initial thought process. And if I can make another statement, in addition to that, I want to step for, currently, I have three youth investing programs that will be starting this year. And the reason why I'm really happy about those is, for two reasons. Number one, the human capital in which I'll be giving them in terms of them learning and their intellectual property. The second thing is through these investment programs for being in a six month program, we have a sponsor that have sponsored each kid. So each kid will be starting off with $350 and I will invest that $350. And, and at the end of the program, they have a scholarship waiting for them to start their real investment account with a lot more. So that I'm, so not only am I able to give human cap, but I'm also able to give equity to the communities in which I want to see do better. Because a lot of times parents don't have that extra money or free cash flow sitting to the side to get their kids started, to buy a couple of shares of Apple to start a custodial account for their child. Mm -hmm. But you know what? You go through this program, you learn for free, we'll find the investors and the people who want to invest in you and we'll put that capital to use. And you know what? Have a scholarship waiting for you at the end. One of the programs, we went a little step further. We they, they get, instead of a scholarship, they have crypto waiting for them at the end of the program. We're going to oh, wow. give all of them with one token of Ethereum, which is about $2,000 right now. So um, we're really giving equity, not only human capital to these students. And that's something I'm really happy about because I'm not just giving them encouragement. I'm giving them the money so that they can do it. And because they are so young, the, the thing I didn't throw in there is these are one of the programs, high school, they won't get that money until they finish high school. So that's one of the criteria you have to finish high school. So this is a three-year investment. So that money can go really long after that's, three years. So we're talking yeah, about fantastic. We're talking about enough money to buy a car, enough money to put down in the house type money for these kids. So it's gonna be really something special. It's gonna be really small because that's the only way we'll be able to have it run efficiently and them really learn. But I'm really excited about it. And I feel like that's going to be my moment where I feel like I'm really making change and impact. Where I'm able to give this equity and human capital to the community, not just a good word. Yeah, David, I, I love that. That's going to be your legacy right there. That's amazing. I'm hoping. I'm hoping. And I'm hoping that with what they learn in the, the class that, that they're going to take with you, that when they do graduate from high school, that they don't just go buy a new car or something like that, that they actually yeah, exactly. invest. Invest, so, yeah. Yeah, that's, if you're talking about making impact in the world, that's making impact right there. And what age is it that they start? Do they start this at ninth, in ninth grade? Is this like a- So uh, they started, so, so two of the programs, they will be starting in high school in 10th grade. And then after the six month investing program, from there, they were going to two year internships for the junior and senior years. Those internships will be geared towards careers where you don't need a college degree, such as being a realtor being a CPA. These are great industries they can go into that they don't have to go to college for and make really good money to live a really good lifestyle. And guess what? They also have that scholarship money at the end that they can use to start that business up. And they already have all the experience they need. So they have, they're becoming out of high school productive citizens in society who are ready to invest in themselves and invest in their business. And then the other program is for um, children who have aged out of foster care. So we're talking 18 to 21. That program is a year long, and that's the program where they'd be gifted crypto as opposed to the scholarship. And then that program said, because there's a lot of people I know that there's a lot of kids that age out of foster care and they end up becoming homeless. So you have these programs such as Dash to Freedom here in Miami, 
where they have they provide housing for these students so they can transition to productive adults in society. And then they brought me in through my nonprofit to provide the expertise of investing to teach them that. I, I love it, man. That so what you're doing right now, you do it with a passion. And I, I feel like if you're gonna do anything seriously in life, you have to do it with a passion. And you're definitely passionate about it, man. David, this is absolutely amazing. This whole conversation and everything that you're doing, I'm absolutely thrilled to be talking about this stuff with you. So uh, yeah. I want to ask you, because uh, as time's getting short here, for, for somebody who's just now getting ready to get started, and some, we'll, we're talking about like our younger audience here, right? The, the young men and women that are in their 20s and 30s that, hey, I just paid off my student loans or I just got out of debt and now I'm ready to start investing. What would you say to somebody in that situation for what they should look at doing today? Very simple. Um, find a certain amount of money. I will say this, lo lower your consumption. Hmm. Lower your consumption. Be, um, be okay. For, I'll tell you right now, I, my car is paid off and I, it will always, I've, always, I've never made payments on the car. That's because I've never felt the need to, to show off that I have money via my car. Lower your consumption, lower what you think you need to show people in terms of what you have, but instead live below your means for a few years and invest. When I word you invest in what you consume. So if you have Apple, invest in Apple. If you believe in crypto, invest in Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Cardano. Those are the best ones to invest in. Why? Because they're the most disruptive and they, have, they actually bring something to the world in terms of what we do in application. That's why we do and invest in the index, NASDAQ, Dow, or S&P. Invest in the index, invest in the stock, invest in the crypto, and buy every month. You'll love yourself for it in 10 years. Definitely sounds like a key, key thing you're talking about here is diversify. Don't just put ah. it in the basket, right? Uh, yeah. Awesome, man. So everybody, look, King David here. We had an awesome conversation. This has been amazing. So there's going to be people listening to the show that want to know more about you. They want to know about, more about your consulting. They want to know mm -hmm. more about your nonprofit. So where can people go to find more information about King David and everything that he's doing? So give a website, yeah. social media, or anything like that you can mm -hmm. share with us. Yeah. So if you'd like to personally find out about me, please look me up on LinkedIn under David M. Torrance. In terms of my nonprofit, you can go to kpsystem.org or, or social media or on Instagram, kp.k. And then if you want to list, look me up on Instagram as well, personally, Throne CG, um, as well as David M. Torrance. Anything, David, all my social media is under David M. Torrance, my, my personal name. So it's easy for me, for people to find out. But LinkedIn, you can find my credibility and all that. That's a big, and that's a big thing in investing. People want to see that you're credible and reputable. So I, I like to give it my LinkedIn just so that people can find that information there. Absolutely. I, I love LinkedIn. It's a powerhouse. It, I, I feel like some people, it's, it's underutilized, I would think. I agree. In, in the professional space. Absolutely love it. David, absolutely love everything that you're doing. Thrilled that you took some time out of your day on a Saturday to have a conversation with me and and share your story and share what you're doing. It, it's been an absolute blast. So everybody that's listening, go check out the, the websites that he talked about and his social media. I'll make mm -hmm. sure I have links to all that in our show notes to make it easy for you to just copy and paste it. Yeah, definitely check out the stock market activity book that, that he made. And actually, uh, if you could send me a link to that, where we can buy that at too, I'll make sure I get that in the show notes. So awesome. I'm probably going to get a copy of that for my uh, daughters as well. So Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be cool. And you can buy it on Amazon. Just look up stock market activity book, Wall Street Twins. It's available on Amazon. Wall Street Twins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm serious. I'm going to go check that out and, and pick it up. Hey, everybody. So there you have it. Interview with uh, David Torrance here. Absolutely amazing. David, thank you, again, thank you so much. And uh, we'll chat again in the future, I'm sure. All right. Peace and love. Thank you. All right. Aloha.